So then, back into um, Hebrews chapter 10. You remember Paul starts the chapter off by reaffirming that the, the law, the, the law of Moses, the rituals and the, the ceremonies, um, was a shadow of good things to come. The good things to come, of course, were the things pertaining to the salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we just reiterated that um, by shadow, he, it, as it says in that verse, not the very image of those things. In other words, um, the things, those rituals and ceremonies were not the real thing that God in my, had in mind, something he didn't intend to last um, forever. They were just types or foreshadows of greater things uh, pertaining to uh, Christ. And then an example of the shadowy nature um, of the law is given in verse 4 by saying it was not possible for the blood of bulls and, and goats to take away sin. The reason being because they, being part and parcel of the rituals and ceremonies of the law, they also were um, only a shadow. They were only a type of the, uh, the sacrifice of Christ, not the real sacrifice, not the real thing that God really had in mind um, for the, the future. We, we considered the reasons uh, why animal sacrifices could not conquer and take away sin, which meant that during the 1,500 odd years that the law of Moses was in vogue, sin and death um, was not, in fact could not, be conquered. And so verse 5 says that when Jesus comes into the world, he says, and remember that the, the Apostle Paul is putting into the mouth um, of Jesus the words of Psalm 40, Psalm 40, verse 6, six to 8. And uh, those verses in the psalm start off by saying, um, sacrifice and offering you, that is God, did not desire. And if we ask the question, well, why? Why would God, after instituting those sacrifices and offerings, and uh, of them continuing for you know for fifteen hundred hundred uh, years, um, why was is it saying here that He did not desire them? Well, the reason is because, as He's already said, they were only shadowy things. Um, they were only a, a shadow um, of better things to come, and they could not conquer or take away sin. So God didn't, um, he didn't desire them. That is, he, he didn't find satisfaction. Um, they didn't completely satisfy him, um, the, the, the sacrifices, the animals that were offering. It can also be inferred or implied that God did not desire or, or find satisfaction in animal sacrifices um, due also to the people's failure, generally speaking, to offer them in the right spirit. So often in Israel's history, the, they offered their animals um, with a resentful um, spirit. Um, they, in fact, they so resented offering their best animals, they, they at different times, offered second-rate animals, animals that had... Um, blemishes and things like that and uh, for, for the most part um, the Israelites had a bad attitude towards the sacrifices that they were offering which was another reason uh, in different times when God didn't desire them, in fact sometimes he said I wish you'd stop doing it, you know, because their attitude was so bad so um, Jesus fulfilled the will of God 100%, as we know, 100% obedience, which, not, which neither the animals or the people could do. And so in so doing, he was the perfect sacrifice and he fulfilled um, God's desire. God was totally satisfied in his sacrifice. In fact, we read, there's a verse in Isaiah 53, um, which, which speaks about God seeing the travail of his soul and being satisfied. And if you didn't know any better, because seeing the travail of his soul is actually referring to when Jesus was travailing in pain um, 
on the cross when he, when he was dying. And if you didn't know any better, you think God must be a bit of a sadist to say that um, he was um, satisfied, found pleasure, as it were, in seeing his son suffer um, like that. But it wasn't so much that God enjoyed to see him suffer. What God was satisfied about was the fact that in spite of that intense pain and intense suffering, Jesus dug, still dug his toes in and refused to be disobedient. He, re, he refused to toss in the towel, as it were, which he could have done, could have called on more than 12 legions of angels if he wanted to, but he was faithful and obedient right uh, unto the end. And of course, it's, it's under, the, under the stress and trial of pain in particular that the, the depth of a person's faith um, is, is manifested. Mm. So many um, would toss in their faith um, be, because of you know, being faced with death, uh, especially crucifixion, but um, not Jesus. And so God was really satisfied. Uh, he was not satisfied with the animal sacrifices because, as we've seen, they couldn't take away sin. <coughs> there was no way they could do that. And uh, God had something greater, something better in mind and it wasn't until that came, which was Jesus, that he would then be fully um, satisfied. So coming back to verse 5, after saying Christ came into the world, saying to God, animal sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, the, the spirit of Christ um, in Psalm 40 then says to God, but a body you did prepare for me. Now, as we see in verse 10, the body is referring to the body of Christ, Christ himself. It says that we've been um, sanctified through the, the sacrifice or through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. So that verse uh, that, that talks about um, the, um, the, uh, the body, a body, that has prepared for me is referring to Christ himself, the body of Christ. Now, that word um, prepared, the Greek word katatizo, uh, according to Strong, means to complete, uh, to complete thoroughly. I notice it's, it's translated a number of times in the New Testament. One time in particular that interested me was in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, where it's translated perfectly joined together. And that triggered off the thought in my mind um, of that psalm, Psalm 139, which refers to, David's referring to himself actually, but you know, he was a type of Christ. And David refers to himself being awesomely and wonderfully um, made. And he refers to himself being intricately weaved in the womb, how that he was perfectly, all his parts were all perfectly joined together as he, as he was growing in the womb. And the way he speaks there is that God was watching. God was watching over his development in the womb and seeing to it that he came out the kind of person that God wanted him to be. And I believe that that principle applies here to what we're reading. In fact, Rotherham, Rotherham puts it, but a body thou hast fitted for me. A body thou hast fitted for me. And the statement, <coughs> the, the statement seems to be saying that Jesus, Jesus is acknowledging by, by saying, because it's, it's Jesus speaking, a body thou hast prepared me. He seems to be saying that to God that he's acknowledging that he was divinely prepared or fitted from mm -hmm. the womb for the task of being the perfect sacrifice for sin. And we know that due to divine begettal and the human conception, the body of Jesus was indeed fitted or equipped to deal the death blow to sin, right. and, uh, and, sin and, and sin in the flesh. We know that through human conception, he inherited sinful flesh. That is, he, in, in, he inherited a nature that had a propensity towards sin, but through divine conception, he inherited a propensity um, for knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And um, 
we know that Isaiah chapter 11 prophesied that that would be the case because it says that the Spirit of the Lord will be upon him to give him knowledge and wisdom and a quick understanding in the fear um, of the Lord. And I believe that through him being divinely conceived, that was the advantage that he, he inherited from his father from his father God. But like I say, through being conceived by, the, by a, a woman who had the sinful nature, he inherited also from her those sinful propensities um, of, that, um, of that nature. We know how important it was for Jesus to, to grow very quickly from, uh, from a very young age in knowledge and wisdom and understanding because that was really the key to overcoming sin. We know it's not just knowledge, it's the application of knowledge, but you can't apply knowledge that you haven't got. And uh, Jesus clearly grew um, very quickly in knowledge and wisdom and understanding, which fortified him against the power or the propensities of sin, enabling him, even from a really early age, to overcome sin and never fall prey to it. And so we read in Isaiah 53, verse 11, By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. It's just one of those passages of Scripture that is acknowledging that his knowledge of the Word of God had so much to do with him being able to become our justification mm. and uh, our, um, our righteousness. So... Um, uh, That's how I would see that, that verse 5. It's sort of saying, because there is no record of Jesus ever actually saying to God, uh, um, a body thou hast prepared. Or in other words, my body you have prepared. Um, but because there's no record, it doesn't, doesn't mean to say Jesus never said it mm. in his private devotions to God. But um, the prophecy, which is the <coughs> spirit of Christ in the psalmist, which is the Spirit of God, of course, in the psalmist, was prophesying um, that that was what Jesus would be thinking. That's what the Messiah um, would be thinking. That's what he would be acknowledging. And he would be acknowledging to God, well, I am what I am because you've prepared me that way. Mm. You have made me mm. that way. And Jesus would recognize how special he was because he was the only begotten Son of God. No other person ever in history or ever will be divinely begotten like him and therefore be specially prepared as one needed to be to deal the death blow to sin and to go through life and, um, and never sin. I, no <coughs> I noticed, Barry, in the, the psalm, Psalm 40, verse 6, that you've alluded to that that's quoting from, <coughs> it's worded quite differently. Yeah, we'll like, come to that. Oh, okay, all right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts in relation to that fifth, to the fifth verse? I remember for years, for years when I when I read um, this verse uh, that when Jesus came into the world, it, uh, uh, that when it says that 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 God said, God said, I used to think that God was speaking to the Jews when Jesus came into the world. God said to the Jews, to Jesus' contemporaries. And where he said, virtually said to the Jews, you didn't want to offer me animal sacrifices, but you prepared the body of my son and put him to death, thinking you were doing me a favour. And <laughs> that was how I used to always um, read that. And uh, in so doing, I used to think of Cain. He, he wouldn't offer animal sacrifices, didn't want to do that, but he had no compunction about killing his brother, uh, righteous Abel. And I used to think that was basically what, what was being meant there. But, of course, um, later on, through further um, thought, I realised that um, it wasn't really the correct, mm. the correct interpretation. But it was, I mean, it's true in itself in a way, mm. isn't it? Mm. You know, the Jews reneged about offering animal sacrifices, but they had no problem about taking hold of the body of Jesus and putting him to death. Mm. Hmm. So in verse, in verse 7, then said I, then said I, now these, this is a continuation of the words that are put into the mouth of Jesus um, from, from Psalm 40, 
Then said I, Lo, I come, as it is written of me in the volume of the book. Uh, and again, there's no record of Jesus actually saying that, but we know from the prophecy in the psalm that that was certainly his thought, that was his thinking, that was his, um, his conviction. And so Jesus, so, so Jesus, Jesus knew that um, his coming and his doing the will of God, um, it was in the volume of the book. It was, it was written of them. Um, volume of the book, referring, of course, to the volumes of prophecies in the, the scriptures, which um, showed that Jesus, um, which indicated Jesus was foreordained, he was predestined to do the will of um, of God to fulfill what is written um, of me and uh, you know I don't know how many of you have ever put yourself into Jesus's position you know as he grew up and and became more and more aware of his true identity and and reading about himself in the scriptures yeah. and reading about the high expectations of God concerning him and uh, what, what he was required to do, um, it must have been very challenging um, to him. And of course, to a degree, we have the same experience because there's a lot written in Scripture about what God expects of us and what his desire you know, towards us is. And uh, it should also be um, challenging to us. difference, of course, between us and Jesus is that um, we don't always measure up, <laughs> um, but of course he um, he did, mm. Mm. and uh, instead of saying to do Thy will, O God, is this what you were referring to, John? No. Um, instead of saying to do Thy will, O God, Psalm forty verse eight says, "I delight to do Thy will. Thy law is is within my heart." So uh, it wasn't just a question of Jesus doing the will of God. The psalm actually says that um, his spirit, what, it, he delighted. It, it was a pleasure to Jesus to do the, uh, the will of God, even though at different times the flesh would be reneging, uh, as we all experience, and wanting to go uh, a selfish, um, self-centered way. Um, Jesus didn't sort of groan with himself and wish he could wish he could go that way he actually delighted he mm. delighted to put the flesh in its place to tell sin where to get off <laughs> and uh, and to and to and to do the will um, of of God and of course the the implication of all this is that due to animal sacrifices not being able to take away sin causing God to not find pleasure or satisfaction in them, um, he prepared the body, a human, not an animal. He prepared a man, not an animal, who gave him the pleasure and satisfaction due to taking away um, sin. So the way in which Jesus gave God pleasure and satisfaction is explained in his words, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, because it's speaking of um, obedience. Mm. Obedience, not just during his, his life, but as Philippians says, obedience unto death, not just an ordinary death, not dying of old age or dying in his sleep, no, even the death of the cross. Mm. I've, I've always, I think I've mentioned that before. It always impresses me how Paul words that. He's, he talks about Jesus being obedient unto death, even, mm. even the death of the um, of the uh, the cross, and of course, um, I think I quoted it last time. If we read in Samuel, obedience mm. is better than sacrifice. Yeah. The animal sacrifices that is, um, and to hearken mm. is better than the than the fat of um, an, um, ra fat Rams. of lambs. No, yeah, yeah. I was actually referring back to verse five, Barry. Um, in Hebrews 10 there, it says, A body you have prepared for me, but the equivalent part of Psalm 40 says, My ears have you opened. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's quite different on mm. the surface. Prepared yeah. a body, 
but my ears you have, you have opened. So I think, I think there's a couple of ways you can look at that. Obviously, you know, the, the writer in Hebrews isn't misquoting scripture. This is just God allowing for two different things to be, to be leading in the same direction. Mm. Um, because obviously, like most of the modern translations render that part in Psalm 40, um, my ears have you opened or you have given me ears to hear or to listen. And of course, that was integral to Jesus' obedience. Right. He had a listening ear. You know, he was listening to what God told him to do, what, what God you know, instructed him. Mm. Um, so, so there's that, that element. But also the interesting thing is um, when in Psalm 40 it says, my ears you have opened, that word opened literally means to dig. Mm. And, and it's actually translated in the Old Testament most times dig in reference to like digging holes. And obviously it's got something to do with ears, digging an ear, sort of all sounds a bit strange. But it, it reminded me, um, you know, under the law when someone was a servant and they would finish their, their period of, of servitude, you know, as a Jew to yeah. a, a fellow Jew, and then they were allowed to go free. But if they decided that they loved their master and they didn't want to go, then remember what happened? They would stick their ear against the doorpost and it would be bored or, or, or dug through. Mm. And I, I'm wondering whether that, that, you know, that scripture in Psalm 40 is an allusion to that because, again, it fits the theme because the whole theme and, and what we've just discussed is Jesus' servitude and his obedience and his, his desire to want to, you know, be connected to his master, right? Mm. So that Psalm 40 seems to be alluding to that. Yeah. That, you know, my mm. ears you have dug, that's, that's the literal meaning, which equates to the Hebrews 10 passage, my body you have prepared. Mm. So being a servant, being prepared to, to stay true to his master is the same as, as preparing a body. And, you know, when you think about that as well, you can just see how God did this. You know, yes, and I'm not taking the glory away from Jesus. He had to choose to be obedient, yeah. but God knitted him. You know, God knitted Jesus in the womb in such a way because, because remember, he, he inherited the flesh, mm. but being divinely begotten, he inherited, you know, genetic, spiritual, spiritual genes. But God had to make that balance right. Mm. You know, even in human terms, you can get, you know, say... You know, really, well, let's just pick a physical attribute and get a, a, a beautiful um, mother and maybe an ugly father, and the child is beautiful or they're ugly, you know, depending mm. on the genetics. So Jesus, as far as his obedience, his ability to overcome, the balance had to be right, didn't it? Right. So in, in mm. that sense, God very much prepared every way that the way Jesus was going to be prepared to choose to be a, a servant. Mm. So yeah, I just thought that that apparent difference actually all blends quite beautifully when you think about you know Jesus' ears being opened and dug and prepared and all that. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. And also too, um, <clears throat> in relation to in the body being prepared, that includes the mind. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. And um, he was given understanding yep. and knowledge. Uh, interesting, I remember looking at that quick understanding um, and I didn't understand where the quick came from when I looked up uh, the words and I'm going back probably eight, ten years ago when I did that so I can't remember all the ins and outs of it but um, yeah I've often wondered where the word quick came from mm. quick understanding Mm. Yeah, that's Isaiah 11. That's Isaiah 11. Um, literally means to blow or to breathe. So in other words, God was blowing upon Jesus, giving him his spirit, if you like. Because yeah. it, mm. it's, it's Ruach. That whole phrase, you shall make him of quick understanding, is just Ruach. Yeah, mm. that's what I mean. Yeah. Mm. God, by his spirit, yeah. by his breath. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. It was a, when you think about it, it was an unusual, I was going to say custom, but I, I <laughs> yeah. couldn't say custom because yeah. it was the law, it was, it was yeah. a divinely um, given law that um, when a servant wanted to become um, a servant for life mm. to his master, 
for the for the master to to get a sharp instrument mm. and um, and hold his servant ear up against the doorpost yeah. and bore a hole. I mean, ear piercing, piercing <laughs> is a very common thing today, but it's yeah. not done quite no. quite like that. No. Um, but to, you know, uh, I, I guess you know they wouldn't even thought about sanitising the uh, mm. the instrument. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah. that, that they were, that they were, um, you know, doing it with, but uh, certainly, like certainly, as a, as you pointed out, the margin g gives that alternative mm. rendering uh, instead of opened of of digged. Yeah. It's like and, a crucifixion. Pardon? It's like a crucifixion in yeah. a sense, isn't it? Yeah, and so it was just indicating Messiah's um, lifelong service. Um, as a servant to the Lord, right. and of course, to be a servant, one had to have uh, an open ear, yep. uh, not just an ear bored through, yep. but he had to have a, an ear listening to his master's instructions, yep. and of course, being being obedient um, to to those in instructions, and uh, that's that is sort of summarised in that thing. Yep. I want to do Thy will, O God, right. or I delight to do Thy will, mm. um, O O God. But um, it is significant, I think, that, um, su that Jesus submitting himself to God um, literally involved being pierced. Right. Not his ear, yeah. but his hands mm. um, and, and his, his feet. And you've got to wonder, you know, sometimes in the law, there are these subtle little things mm. That actually only the tip of the iceberg that that mean much much more to the to a discerning person than what it seems to be saying on the surface, mm. and one could very easily imagine that God, in this very very vague subtle sort of way, is saying something uh, in relation to piercing, piercing an ear, mm. you know. Um, in order for um, a servant to become a lifetime servant, mm. um, I think it would be expecting too much for anybody prior to the crucifixion of Jesus yep. and the Holy Spirit being poured out to understand yeah. or to see that it might be pointing forward to something in relation to the piercing of Messiah. Um, but it wouldn't be difficult um, to sort of see something like that um, uh, in it. Yeah. I mean, to be the ear, the ear was pierced and virtually nailed to the, the yeah. post yeah. of the house. Yeah. And they weren't concrete posts in those days. It was wood, a wooden pole, which mm. is what Jesus was crucified. Mm. Jesus was pierced on a wooden pole. And it was the wooden pole that the ear was actually nailed to. Um, temporally, that is. Mm. But then again, Jesus was only temporally yeah. uh, nailed to the cross, a bit longer probably than the year mm. was, was, uh, was, was nailed to. But um, my looking at the um, my ears, um, thou hast my ears thou hast opened, even without seeing the significance of digged or or bored, mm. um, reference to opened ears, um, signifying willingness to listen and respond to the will of God, um, that, that's, that sort of speech is used elsewhere mm. in its sort of broad, broad language. For instance, Isaiah 50 verse 4 to 6, the Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious right. and did not turn backwards. And then you contrast Isaiah 48 verse 8, you never heard, that is never listened, so you have not known from of old, your ear has not been opened. Mm. So that it, just that expression by itself, without even seeing the boring um, or, or piercing aspect, um, is, is talking about one um, whose ears are opened, mm. a listening ear, a receptive ear, an ear that wants to understand and uh, as a result to, to be um, obe obedient. It was true too, wasn't it, Barry, that when the priests were ordained, I think Aaron did it with his sons, he had to put blood on the ear, mm. on the thumb, mm. and on the big toe, mm. which talks about hearing, right. doing, 
Mm-hmm. And walking. And walking. Yeah. And of course, the big toe is what gives you balance, and your thumb is what gives you a grip. Mm. And uh, so, in other words, it's talking about taking hold of and walking mm. and bal- being a, a balanced life. Right. Uh, mm. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so the the implication of all that you know Paul is saying here is that if animal sacrifices <clears throat> were unable to take away sin and fulfil the will of God or give Him satisfaction, and Christ's willing and obedient sacrifice did fulfil the will of God and gave God satisfaction, then the implication is animal sacrifices must become redundant. Mm. They must be removed. They must be taken away. Even though, even though, as verse 8 says, they were offered according to the law. Because a a Jew would argue, well, what are you talking about? These these were offered according to the law. God's law said this must be done. You're telling me now that God didn't want it to be done or he wasn't satisfied with it, with it being done, but Paul's argument is, is so good, mm. it's, so, it's so convincing, he's showing, he's showing that even though, even though the law said these things should be done, um, it, it had to be temporary, it had to be shadowy, um, because it wasn't achieving the objective of um, taking away sin. So this implies, of course, that the old law covenant involving animal sacrifices um, has been taken away and a new covenant ratified by the blood of Jesus has been um, established. And I think, as I say, that that really is the point in all of this. This is the point that Paul is driving at and showing um, from from the psalm, really. He's, Mm. He's building the whole thing. Uh, on the psalm, because the Jews, um, well, there was no New Testament in those days. Um, the Jews had to be it had to be proven from the Old Testament scriptures, because uh, they only rega- they only regarded those as being inspired by God. Incidentally, um, reference to sacrifice and offering in verse five. Burnt offering, sacrifice, and, and uh, burnt offerings. Um, no, you sacrifice and offering, verse five, and burnt offerings and sin offerings in verse six are the four great offerings of the law. They encompass the peace offering, the meal offering, the burnt offering, and the sin offering. And what Paul's saying is that they're all gone. Hmm. Not just one or two of them. They've all gone. They've, um, and, and he enumerates them all to show. None of them, none of them could take away sin, so none of them could remain. All been made redundant, no exceptions um, at all. Hmm. I've got, I've, I've written down here uh, Hebrews 10 verse 8 to 9 from, from the Good News Bible, um, which just sort of reates in, in plain language what we've been saying. It reads like this. First, Jesus said, um, to God, you neither want nor are you pleased with sacrifices and offerings or with animals burnt on the altar and the sacrifices to take away sin. Jesus said this even though all these sacrifices are offered according to the law. Then Jesus said, Here I am, O God, to do your will. So God does away with all the old sacrifices and puts the sacrifice of Christ in their place. Because Jesus Christ did what God wanted him to do, we are all purified once and for all from sin by the offering that he made of his own body. Mm. Sometimes, you know, and I was thinking this when Morris was reading the reading tonight from uh, his translation, sometimes you can get uh, a good translation that virtually is like a commentary. Mm. Uh, I always remember my friend Graham Yearsley when the, um, the New English Bible first came out and it was so much easier to mm. understand than the old King James <laughs> Version. And um, one Sunday morning at the meeting, 
a brother gave a, stood up and gave the word of exhortation and uh, he um, was sharing or expounding a certain um, section of, of scripture and going through it like we do, um, looking at the words and the meaning of the words and all the rest of it and that. And uh, Graham went up to him after. He says, you know, brother, he says, I got the New English Bible here and it just says exactly what you said. <laughs> It says exactly what you said in just a few, in just a, just a paragraph or two. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking that tonight as Morris was ready, I think, oh, we don't really need to, we don't really need to go over all this because it's, it's really, it was really so, um, so, well, so well put. And that's one of the advantages of um, modern translations. Um, you've got to be careful with them, of course, yeah, yeah. because sometimes... Um, there can be doctrinal bias mm. and um, if the text lends itself to doctrinal bias well then uh, most of them will take it mm. because most of the translators are Trinitarians and do believe in the, in the traditional orthodox um, doctrines but you know when you think about it um, I'm not aware of anything um, that is said in the laws concerning animal sacrifices that, that clearly indicated that they foreshadowed a perfectly obedient human sacrifice. Mm. Can anybody think of, of, in relation to that? I mean, the, the, they were just, God just commanded them to do, offer the sacrifices. We're not aware of actually coming out in the open and plainly saying, well, you know, uh, these are actually pointing forward to a human sacrifice. Mm. The, the, the sacrifice of Messiah w was not a clearly um, defined... I mean, it's there mm. in the Scripture um, for those that the Holy Spirit quickened, like the Apostle Paul, to, you know, to bring out, but it wasn't loudly and clearly proclaimed. Um, and all through the period of offering animal sacrifices... Um, you can understand in a way for them not realising that they were only a shadow, uh, just, a, just a fleeting shadow really, mm. pointing to the sacrifice um, of, of Christ. Of course, not, not being moral creatures, animal sacrifices themselves could not convey in any way that they were pointing to, to a, a sacrifice involving moral obedience. I mean, true, the animal sacrifices um, had to be sacrifices without spot and without blemish, but that was physically, that was a, that was a, physical, a physical thing, not mentally or morally or spiritually. There, there was nothing in that that would cause a person to immediately think, oh, this is pointing to a, a mental or a moral or a spiritual perfection, um, which we know was the case in the sacrifice of, um, of Jesus and of course the animal sacrifices had to be perfect physically and like I say they couldn't be morally because they weren't moral creatures but in Jesus' case he was not perfect physically but he was perfect morally mm. and mentally and, and physically we know he wasn't perfect physically because he had mortal sinful flesh mm. we know that, uh, if, that if he had been left dead in the tomb, he would have corrupted away. And as we've already seen in our studies from Hebrews, a number of times it talks about him not being perfect and of often being perfected as a result of his sacrifice and his, um, his, re his um, resurrection. So the, um, the, perfect physical, the perfect physical condition of the animal sacrifices uh, was intended to convey that Christ would be perfect morally and mentally and um, emotionally. But, I mean, how many Jews could infer that? Mm. Um, no. Where do we get up to? <laughs> Verse 10, I think it was verse 10, because Jesus fulfilled the will of God, we are sanctified 
through the offering of that specially prepared body of Jesus once for all. I think we, we all know sanctified means made holy. And uh, being holy, of course, means conforming, conforming to the example of Jesus and um, making an effort to live a sanctified life, making an effort to live a life um, of not, not um, sinning. Under the law, contact with a, a holy sacrifice, and of course every sacrifice in, in view of it being sacrificed was holy, but contact with a holy sacrifice um, made a priest holy. And uh, that was also pointing forward to um, the fact that um, by having contact with Jesus, um, we are made holy. Now, of course, our contact with him is not physical, um, but we've already seen that the, the physical things of the law, the letter of the law, were so often pointing to spiritual aspects, spiritual factors. And uh, our, our contact with Jesus is by faith. And uh, it's by commitment to him and, and uh, being baptised, being baptised into Christ, we know we put on Christ and uh, he, became, he becomes part and parcel of us. And uh, when Christ is within us, when he is living in us by his word and by his spirit, well then we are transformed from unholy to holy and we, we become sanctified through him. But the word of God does play a very big part in all of this. You remember in John 17 and uh, Jesus' prayer where he, he referred to his followers. He said, they, they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. He said to God, sanctify them. How? Through thy truth. Mm. What's God's truth? Jesus explained, thy word mm. is truth. As you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify um, myself. It's interesting, isn't it? It's sort of almost, you can almost read from that, that Jesus was not just automatically sanctified by being divinely conceived. Mm. No, he, he says, I... For their sakes, I sanctify myself. He, like us, in spite of his miraculous conception, he had to make the effort from day to day to be holy. Mm. Because, like we've been saying, he had the potential to sin. He had the potential to be unholy. And uh, he, like us, had to resist that. He had to fight against that. He had the spiritual warfare just like we have. Mm. And uh, if he wanted to, he could have gone down that unholy route and been, un and been an un un unholy person. But no, mm. he said, for their sakes, I make myself holy because he knew if he wasn't holy, we couldn't become holy because like under the law, if the sacrifice wasn't holy, the priests who came in contact with it, they couldn't be made holy. Mm. So um, it's quite... Yeah, it's, it's quite uh, and then he says that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So it's not just a, it's not just a question of, of a person saying, oh, I believe in Jesus, so I'm holy. Yeah. You know, um, Jesus is emphasizing here, yes, you need me to be holy, but you also need the truth. You also need the word of the truth because it's, it's that word that testifies of him and it's that word that keeps us on the straight and narrow and keeps us enlightened from day to day. A person who doesn't want to read the word or know the word just says, I believe in Jesus, well, then they're ignorant. Yeah. They might believe in the person of Jesus, but that's all they know. They don't know, if they don't know the word, they don't know the requirements of Jesus. They don't know the obligations of um, on the demands of discipleship. That all comes from the word. So uh, mm. you can see the, the, the importance of the combina of the uh, the combination um, there, um, sad to say, there there are unfortunately people around who really don't want to read the word, not really interested in what it says, and they think, oh, I believe in Jesus, I'm okay, you know, mm. and uh, no wonder you find when you get to know them and examine their life, there's just so much wrong um, 
in their life due to not knowing the commandments of Jesus, mm. not knowing, you know, the the, the, the high calling that is um, that is in Him. Mm. We know that the, the the truth, the word of truth, um, it's um, it, it has a wash it has a washing effect, which is necessary to become holy. In John 15 verse 3, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, "Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you." So uh, there he's he's likening the word to water, which of course has a washing. Effects. There's a good verse in Psalm 119 that says, How shall a young person cleanse their way? Mm. And then he answers it, say, By taking heed according to your word. Um, so there's cleansing, there is sanctification um, in, the, uh, in the, uh, the word. In Ephesians 5.26, Paul refers to Christ sanctifying and cleansing the church with the washing of water by the word. So uh, it's, um, it's certainly a very powerful medium when it's taken seriously and uh, when it's read and meditated upon um, regularly. Mm. We have talked in the past about the, the, the different metaphors used for the word. We, as we've seen, water is, is one of them. Fire, fire is, a, is another one. Um, was it Jeremiah said that the word of God was like a fire, fire burning um, within him. Fire, of course, also um, burns out the dross. Mm. Um, the word is also likened to a hammer. In one of the, the prophets, it's referred to as a, as a hammer. And uh, as a hammer is used to, to beat metal into shape, and forming some nice, beautiful shapes and designs. So... The word of God is is like a hammer, and we know that sometimes um, messages or sermons um, can be a bit of a hammering. <laughs> um, and there are, you know, there are, there are other things also that the uh, the word of God is just so important. Um, having these metaphors just help us to appreciate the um, the importance of it. Right. Mm. How, without the word, how would we know God? Yeah. How, how would we know Jesus? That's right. How would we know there was eternal life available? Mm. Um, yeah. Um, it's, and it's just so amazing that no matter what country you live in, no matter what language you speak, um, the word means exactly the same. Mm. And... Uh, it, of course, the word is, is aimed at our minds, at our hearts, mm. um, to change it. Right. Because that's where the problem lies. Mm. So it's got to work in that area. Yeah. And uh, the human spirit. And I think you said this recently, John, in one of your talks. There's only two spirits. Mm. Mm. God's and the human. Mm. And uh, that is so true. Mm. And it's in the spirit that everything takes place. Yeah. That that scripture, Psalm 138, verse two, which says, you know, God has magnified His word above His name, yeah. is is really interesting because you know we're talking about the importance of of God's word, mm. um, but then when you think about God's name. You know, and His name has so much meaning, doesn't it? Because mm. you know, I am that I am. You say, well, I am what? You know, he tells us in Exodus, you know, he's long-suffering, he's, he's righteous, doesn't, doesn't pardon, you know, iniquity, whatever. All of those elements are God's name. Right. But he says his word is magnified above that. And you sort of think, well, how can that be? But when you think about it, it makes perfect sense because how can you get to know God and know his name and what his name represents without his word. Mm. So his word is, is, is very much you know, magnified above even who he is because it's that word that, that gets us to who he is. Yeah. How, how would we know that we can talk to God mm. without mm. his word? Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, you can talk to the, the creator mm. through his son mm. for us. But, yeah, it's mind-boggling, really, yeah. when, you, when you think about it. Certainly is. <coughs> yeah. 
All right, well, we've covered those 10 verses. We can move on from there next time.